Thank you all so much for being here. We're just going to do a super informal Q&A session. So to start, do you guys want to introduce yourselves and just pick up the mic and we'll pass it along? Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Poirier. I uh, work with Metamorphosis. I am a molecular and cell biologist, and my role on the team is to help to collect and organize the data and to write our papers. I'm Hamil Patel. Um, I sit around and dream up studies and things that we do. Um, we, I'm at UCSD, and so we organize the research team that basically takes the samples once they leave here and do all kinds of assays on them, and you've seen lots of the data that we've generated. I'm Kevin Crow. Good morning. I'm head of operations for Metamorphosis, uh, Dr. Joe's data collection company. Good morning. I'm um, Dr. Toby, or Toby Malabertram. I'm the um, owner of Vitamet Research. Vitamet Research, you may have seen it on the, um, on the slides, is the um, private company that is supporting this research. Um, in the team, I, um, I'm the principal investigator. That means everything that goes wrong is my fault. That's basically <laughs> what it means. <laughs> and you have to sign papers. So um, for clinical research, it's important that uh, you know, the data collection is very controlled and, uh, and done. So my background is more clinical research. Hermel is the real researcher doing real science. I basically go from idea to freezer. That's kind of my, so when we have an idea, we want to run a study, then okay, how do we collect the data? How is the form, how does the form have to look like where we want to co you know, collect the information? How do we set everything up? It's, it's a lot of more boring background uh, things, but you know, being a German, I like my papers and I'm like everything signed and every box checked, so it works out really well. My name is Dr. Hilary Hamilton and I am the Director of Donor Relations with Inner Science. And we're so happy that you guys are all here this morning with us to do this Q&A. Is there anyone in the room that wants to ask a question? So if you look at the transition of where the research started and where it's going and where it is right now, um, it really started with sort of a curiosity, right? Is there something happening in the room? And so for the first year, year and a half, we focused really on healthy meditators that were at events to see what happened to them. This is how most standard meditative papers were focusing. They weren't looking at disease, they were just looking at the healthy person going through that process. The next evolution was what you observed as well, right? Toby and I came to these events and we're seeing all these miraculous things happening and it just sort of begs the question, is there something going on? This is where the quantum studies then take off, where we start looking at disease processes and the meditative practice. Where we've been sort of at for the last then two years are observational studies. People are choosing to come to these events. We then observe what they're happening in different groups, whether they're controls sitting at the pool, novices that are going through sort of their first experience, and then experienced meditators have been here lots of times and going through that. But we're just pie in the sky, sort of observing what's happening at these events and making sort of research things. So this has been important in creating a foundation of, of data and, and sort of ideas biochemically and molecularly that tie to that effect. The research retreat that we're having here, <clears throat> the discussion is how do we then evolve this to the next step? How do we take this so that a physician or a hospital group can look at this and say, this is something we wanna try in our hospital. So today the discussion for our research retreat after we finish here is about randomized controlled trials. So how do you actually do a trial at an event that randomly selects individuals, so you're no longer observing, you're putting them into specific treatment arms and groups, and you're seeing what the benefit of this arm is where someone sits in the Joe Dispenza retreat all week long versus someone who does nothing and versus someone who does something sort of halfway there and not complete. Then it's evidence-based science that we will then show that there's something in the room that's creating this effect against the disease, and when you compare it to a group that's doing nothing and relaxing, that there is a true benefit. And when you can identify that true benefit, this is now how you get things into clinical application. The other piece to bring up here is that while at the same time we're doing the data collection and analysis, we also have operations happening. So Inner Health Coalition, I haven't seen Dr. Carla Stanton, but if she's in the room, wave. Uh, 
Dr. Stanton is actually leading the Inner Health Coalition, which are clinicians from all across the world, different disciplines that are operationalizing this into their practices. So they're using the NCS model that's been evolved into a protocol that can be used within the clinical setting. And that's happening at the same time that this is going on. So not my area of expertise. We'll actually, we can hook you up with Dr. Carla if you'd like. And just wanted to put a little more color around um, what Hermel has said. So what we're doing, don't get us wrong, what we're doing right now is, is legit science, but there's different levels of um, validity or you know, the, the, the strength of the conclusions that you can take out of research. And when it comes to medical practice, so if you want to get a drug approved or a device approved, or you come up with something that you think helps patients, there's a certain a requirement that you have to do if you, for example, want to get a reimbursement code for insurance companies or FDA approval. And this is always the gold standard is randomized clinical trials for the precisely the reason that, um, you know, Hermel has, has explained. One way to, uh, maybe an, an analogy would be, you know, you, you, you're at a pond and you want if there's fish in there. You know, you don't want to go very specific with a fishing rod and, and, and a, fish, a specific lure. You just throw a net in and see if you get something out. And that's in literally what we did in the beginning. Just look at everything and look if there's fish in there. And then we saw, look, there's a bunch of fish, you know, two different types. And then you can go, this one looks like it likes whatever, you know, worms over um, corn kettles or something. And then you say, you know, let's, let's test that. And then you can say, okay, we're going to have 10 rods with um, little worms on it, and we have 10 rods with another lure on it. We put it in and see which one is actually the one that the, the fish prefers. So you can be more specific, you can ask real questions, and then you can uh, make those kind of conclusions. So that's going to be very important. The reason for that is that you can control all of things better. And that's kind of a classic example. I've used it on stage before. Um, if you don't really control for groups and you just look at an outcome, there was one study that found that drinking coffee causes lung cancer. And that's kind of okay, how do you come up with that uh, conclusion? But the data was very solid. They looked at a patient population and they saw, you know, they drink coffee, they had a higher incidence of lung cancer. What they didn't look at was smoking status. And it just so happens that coffee drinkers are more likely to smoke. <laughs> and if you're smoking, you're more likely to get lung cancer. So you can see how you can have the right intention, you can kind of ask the right questions, but if you don't have the experimental design correct, you may end up with, with, with the wrong conclusion. And that is precisely uh, what Hamel was talking about. This is why we want to elevate. It's not that what we are doing right now is wrong, but um, if you, and, and, and by the way, you know, with all the pathophysiology behind it and the pathomechanisms mechanisms that we are showing, it's, it's a completely different level of, um, you know, confidence that we can have, have in the data. But if you just look at the clinical research side, where you want to get at what the gold standard is to talk to anybody in, in the healthcare system right now is randomized controlled trials. And this is exactly where we have to go. We are obviously very interested in that, and uh, you know, one way to do that is uh, that you kind of look at the cases that happen, and then you do, um, you know, a case report or a, a, a case, con you know, a controlled case kind of study. <clears throat> it it takes a lot of um, work for that because what what we would basically do is we identify. Um, participants that have healings and then it would be you know getting getting consents to con contact I think everybody who has been a participant that's one of the things that we ask in the consent form would it be okay for you to share um, medical information with us because those kind of cases it's good to see the outcome but then you want to go backwards and see okay what did they do what kind of things happened and um, really be able to create kind of a holistic picture of what you're describing and those are very interesting. They're usually informing the medical community or the research community about something that might happen. But it's kind of like, um, can I come up with an example? You, 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 know, you over here or over dinner, you have a conversation, say, you know what, I had this patient the other, other day and you know, this and this happened or this and this what they, is what they reported. They went to a meditation retreat and uh, you know, they, they, they are, got cured of their cancer. It's nice to report that. It's nice to make other people think. And it's, like, it's kind of what we call hypothesis generating. You're kind of contemplating, I wonder if something's going on. And if there's something going on, how would I look for that? And then it kind of, it helps you to inform, to design research studies. 
it is it is kind of the lowest level of confidence because you're just describing some something that you observe so it's an observational study study and again you can't extrapolate that or apply that to the general population um, but it's still something we're very interested in and it's something that those kind of cases um, you know insp often inspire people knowing that if the uh, you know if the un abnormal can happen it can instill hope, it can instill you know, buy-in, it can really help people. So it's something that um, we are very interested in. It's just that we haven't put a lot of resources in, but we are in the, on the process, I think, Michelle. We are carrying out studies specific to cancer with um, Coherence, Dr. Joe's official healing group. And in addition to collecting surveys, which are very subjective, we are collecting microbiome samples, we're collecting cheek swab, swab samples, and in an upcoming study, we will be collecting blood samples. So um, we can correlate changes in the biological markers with the survey data, and people send us their lab results as well. So this is pretty exciting. It'll just give us a lot more information about what's going on biologically with these people that have um, spontaneous healings. I think the next level sort of that we would need to get to is to have their complete story, right? Um, and you need to know where in that story they're getting these healings and they're attending these events. And this then requires access to all of their medical records, which we have the ability to do. With AI, you can actually go and mine it with, with learning programs, language learning program kinds of things. Um, lots of our faculty at UC or SD are doing these sorts of things, but it is a massive amount of data then. You basically have to build their story and figure out how this healing is then impacting at that particular juncture in their health progress, right? So it's, it's a lot of samples that you would need to create an effect like that. Thousands of people you'd have to look at versus 10 or 15 in a study. I think there's that's kind of two levels that, that, that I see there. One would just be the physical translation of the findings that we have, and that should be fairly straightforward, I guess. I think so. Yeah, and we can probably make it available. So for the research paper, that's a public paper that can be downloaded and translated. What we've noticed is you have to be kind of a scientist to read a paper, right? There's, there's parts of it that it's written very well, and we can, you can, if you can read English or translate it, the words make sense, um, but they have to make sense to a, a, a scientist, and this is what we had to do to get it published. And so if you have never read a graphic or a figure, it takes a lot of mental energy. When I first started doing this, it would take three, four hours to pour through a paper and how they did this and that to, to really understand what they're doing. Now I can pick up a paper in 10 minutes, I can get through it and get the general idea of what they did correct and incorrect and make my critical sort of judgments on it. It takes a lot of skill to do that. The public generally doesn't have that skill set or the attention span to do that. Um, I learned of an acronym recently, TLDR. I'm like, what the hell is that? Too long, didn't read. Um, <laughs> And, and so this is what I think we need to, it's a barrier that we need to get past. And so there's a lot of discussion about how do you deliver this big finding and many of the findings that are coming up in little pieces that people can digest and understand. And so we've been talking about how to do this and so this will happen. Yeah, so I mean, this is something we've been thinking about. So PEAR really started with it, again, just an observation, right? If you put two extreme groups together, do you see changes? And, and I, physically, if you connect things that are young and old, there are changes that happen. Um, that data I showed, and we're gonna, I think it's just a, an inkling of what's there. Um, when we go through that entire data set, we're gonna show that you can mentally pair BIOS, which is crazy to think that the person you hang out with you get some of their knowledge, information, and you both get better. Um, this then leads to a thousand questions. The ones you're asking are completely relevant, right? What happens when you pair an old person with an old person? What happens when you pair friends with friends, husbands and wives, and all those sort of kinds of things? Disease, non-disease, healed, non-healed. Um, it's gonna launch a series of studies that are gonna last forever. So I think you're gonna see various versions of pair coming out over and over again. And to that point, this is why we are so grateful for the community, grateful for the support, because typically, if you think about it, these are great questions. But if you're just in the general uh, uh, you know, world out there, you would be a, a university-based researcher trying to find 
a subject that is doing the intervention, that has exactly the characteristic that you described and is willing to participate in a research study and you're going to be able to enroll them and get, this is where, this is why, one of the main reasons why research is so expensive. When we talked about the randomized uh, controlled trials, RTCs, typically they cost, well, if you go from idea to, to drug, it's about two and a half billion dollars if you were to do it as a, as a, uh, um, company to develop something and the, the vast majority of the cost is for patient recruitment and actually doing the trial uh, you know just as an example i'm part of uh, you know an nih research network so the national institute of health and um the last study that i participated in they uh, they were hoping that i could recruit recruit 0 0.8 patients per month <laughs> so not even one because it is so typically so difficult to get those. And this is the, this is the norm. This is, you know, we just had this conversation yesterday, the first time we posted a, a, you know, a, a, an email to see if somebody's interested in participating in research. We kind of randomly checked, I think, two hours later, and we had over 700 people that wanted to participate in a study where we needed 20. It's kind of like you're looking at that as somebody in, 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 in research. It's, this doesn't happen. And the other thing, you know, I, I use the analogy of a small pond. We wanted to fish, you know, look for fish. We're not standing in front of a pond. We're standing in front of the ocean. I mean, we have so much to pull from. And the only restriction right now is resources. You know, to the question earlier with the case reports, we have probably dozens that we would like to write up. But somebody has to dig in and somebody has to call and somebody has to make photocopies and get the emails and do all of that. It's just we need we need. You know, we need resources to support all of that. So it's a wonderful, wonderful situation to be in. This is really a kid in a candy store. You don't typically get this kind of opportunity as a researcher to just freely think about what would be the great, best next, next, you know, research. And you have the population to pull from and you have the resources to pay for it. This is really the ideal situation. And we're getting very close with all of your support, either as a participant or as a donor. And we were looking at numbers yesterday at our retreat, and I'd put this series of numbers at the top, and I asked people to guess what those ref referred to, and someone got it in the room. The team started at about two to five people um, in 2019, 2020. Um, it peaked at 50 individuals on the research team in Orlando last November when we did the, the Quantum Two study. And we've essentially stabilized around 30, 35 people in research. So it, the, the, the power has grown in terms of the force, um, and I think it's just going to get bigger, right? There's so many things to look at at these events that it just takes a lot of these raw manpower resources as well as financial resources to happen. That was a very opportunistic study that we did. Um, COVID was everywhere, and we had the resources to study that particular aspect. Um, there are other viruses we looked at, and and we just, again, didn't have the resources to follow up on it. But it is, there are effects on other things. Um, we had designs in place to look at bacterial infections and other types of infective agents as well, and we just never went down that path. The other aspect that we saw in that paper that I think is important is that there are multiple options that people have. The, we did, as control group in that paper, non-meditators that were vaccinated, and they, have, they don't elevate Serpent A5, and there's protective elements that don't tie in with what meditation does. Vaccines don't prevent the COVID virus from getting into the cells. They seem to prevent more morbid disease that happens after the fact. Meditators prevent the virus from actually getting into the cells, so you never have that infective potential and that morbid disease. And so this now creates this alternative path of, of creating resiliency in a human body, right? And gives people's options. And, and this, is what the, this is why I think that paper was so politicized, and it took so long to get through the process. And even when it did get through that process, there had to be lots of qualifiers that we had to put in there that we said were limitations, and they are limitations, but it restricts sort of the, 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 the high nature of that paper, and ultimately. Um, the other thing we've noticed is that I think the meditator um, has a sense of their environment, and so COVID was environmentally controlled at that time. There's lots of infections floating around, and so if there is this higher intelligence, it creates a biology that adapts to that environment. 
as the environment changes, the meditator and their blood products, I think, will change from that perspective as well. And so the interesting sort of next level study would be um, what happens during flu season? Do meditators elevate things that prevent flu from going into their bodies? What happens when there's other sort of pandemics sort of on the line? Is there an intelligence that creates a biology around what's around people? So we don't know, but that's where we're headed. The reason we sort of dreamt up the dream study was um, most people, and, and this is one of the things that's been a conundrum, so there's lots of people at UCSD that are studying mindfulness. The focus of meditative studies has always been the head, right? And so a lot of our studies move out of the head and they're looking at how the body is affected. We're interested in what the head does, but we're really interested in how that impacts the body and then translates back up. The idea behind the dream study is the other point at which most people focus their studies in meditation is during the meditative practice. They never really look at any time points after. Um, so our thought was that there's something that happens at these events that is processed during that sleep phase, right? And so this is the first look at that. Um, we don't know what to expect, but we, you know, I, I haven't been disappointed with any experiment we've done. Something has always come up. Um, and so we expect something unique to come up in this. And, and you know, I don't, I'm not a, I haven't been a big believer in synchronicities, but I guess I'm starting to become a believer in this. Um, <laughs> We, we had designed this study, put it in a place, and there's lots of sleep labs and things on campus that we'd interacted with. Um, and when InterScience made the announcement that UCSD was gonna get these resources, um, I had lots of emails come in, and one of the emails was from someone who's at the Schwartz Center for Computational Biology, um, Neuroscience at UCSD, and she's a sleep specialist and she studies EEGs. And she wanted to collaborate on some other breath studies and things, but now we have an expert that looks at sleep in an EEG profile, and I couldn't have dreamt that up. I mean, it's crazy. Wow. It's nuts. Um, and, and so she's the one that um, did the pair analysis, and it's amazing. And, and um, my sort of challenge to her is explain to this to me like I'm a two-year-old, right? And so she's like, I accept that challenge, and, and her data is absolutely amazing. And so we're really looking forward to having her help on that dream study and the analysis, which is going to be amazing. How the brain processes that information, I think, is going to be very dynamic. And, and we have a pretty eclectic group of individuals um, in the 16 that we've picked, and I think we're going to get a lot of insights. And then we actually have, I think, the most important set of those is controls. People who are here, who are either on staff or on the research team, that are then not allowed to participate wholly in these events. And so we're going to be able to see that are their brains very different from the ones that are immersing themselves in this kind of thing and hopefully some important insights. One thing that I personally would be very interested in, and it's, it's diff a little more in, um, involved to, um, to study, but I think we can do it, is how your subconscious is kind of um, um, processing all of that because most of fMRI and, and EEG and how we're looking at is basically you know looking at the cortical area so more the, the, the function and the cognitive kind of portion and there is there, there are a few really amazing uh, studies out there um, just to give an example um, they've done a study with patients that had cortical blindness that means they had some sort of a stroke or injury to the area of their brain that processes what you see so they were blind, they couldn't see anymore, but the eye was still working, all of the connection all the way to the back of the head was still connection. And there's a lot of connections from the brain, sorry, from your eyes that go to like the amygdala, the fear center, the, the hippocampus, the kind of memory center or so that, so things get, by the time you think about something, your subconscious has already processed a lot of that. So what they did in a study like this, they gave these blind patients a picture of, a, uh, of two houses. One house was normal, the other house was burning. And they just exp uh, explain it to them, you know, look down, you're seeing two houses, show me the one you want to live in. And the significant more people showed, uh, you know, pointed toward the house that was not burning. Which, which, which begs the question that they were still processing, although they were not cognitive processing this, this, this threat, they knew there's something going on. Similar studies, you need about exposure of, I think, between 20 and 50 milliseconds to something to cognitively um, recognize it. So another elegant um, um, experiment, and I don't know the ex uh, remember the exact details, but they 
they put little snippets that were less than 20 milliseconds of um, pictures, for example, in a movie. And the movie was whatever, you saw a cow on a, on, on a pasture or something, very non-threatening, something. Like that. And they just had these little flashes in there of like an atomic bomb going off or a horrible train accident or something like that. Um, but so short that you cognitively didn't recognize that. And then they asked, you know, of course you control that. Somebody, you know, some people saw the movie with it, some people saw the movie without it. And then they, they looked at, first they asked them, you know, how the experience was, and everybody said, it was fine, nice, easy movie, you know, just nothing happened. But the group that also had these little subconscious clues in there had a significant increase in activity in the amygdala, release of stress hormones and things like that. Point being is that, Everything affects you, your subconscious, particularly the things that you're not cognitively processing. And this is precisely what Joe is playing with, where he's trying to imprint the subconscious, get you right to the point where you hear something, but you don't really think about it, but you expose your subconscious on it. And that is something, you know, would be very interesting for, you know, for our group to kind of look at and how can we kind of measure more directly the impact of the meditation on the, you know, limbic system, subconscious, so to speak. The, the data in the twin study suggests that there's a protein response that's um, pro-inflammatory in certain respects, but the gene response is the opposite. And so there is this negative feedback loop that started, right? And so the, and the other thing that the twin study revealed is that there is um, at the beginning of the event, the twins look similar. There's a time point genetically and cytokine-wise and other things that they completely diverge. And we think that this is information gathering, right? So your systems start to shut down and do other things to start taking in more information. And then by the end of the retreat, they contract again. They look more and more similar. And so uh, I think a huge component of this immune response is in that information gathering phase. The proteomic data we have from way, way back from the Orlando Denver study suggests that novice meditators appear to have these dramatic increases in IgG fragments, which would suggest that there's this heightened immune sort of information gathering kind of thing. So what I think is happening at these events that may explain that is you're, you're basically you're turning back your immune system to then start gathering more information from your environment. And the response to a lot of people is they get a little bit sick and that sickness sort of resolves dramatically, but there's a lot of information that the, the body then gains from that and then ultimately allows longer adaptations. So that's the sort of our current rudimentary understanding of it. But we think that there may be important other implications to T cell, B cell, other immune cell functionality. Um, and we were just talking the other day as a side conversation that we need to start measuring those populations on site. And so there's movement in place to start doing that. So just to go along with that theme, um, what we found in our preliminary work with uh, the Garmin data is that there's actually a drop in uh, heart rate variability during the event. Um, and then after the week long is over, it starts to creep back up. So we believe that the meditations are actually causing a, a sympathetic arousal. So kind of a stress, a good stress, which then um, have to, has to get integrated into the body after and leads to improvements. The other aspect is I think we were at the youth group and they were asking about growing limbs and other things back, um, which is a good question. So there are organisms that are able to do that, like salamanders, certain frogs and other things. Um, and if you look at why they're able to do that, it's immune, it's regulated by their immune system. They have a very rudimentary um, immune system that allows for those cells to then uh, basically find and grow. The adaptive advantage that humans had when they created that immune system that was really complicated is you lose that ability to regenerate because it's there's so much information that's gained there that you have to basically prevent toxins and other things from coming in, but then that prevents adaptation in other ways. If you sort of imagine what's happening, if we're becoming more um, neonatal in terms of how our immune system is sort of progressing, then there is this ability to capture more information. But then there's also this innate adaptive ability that's enhanced as well. Um, there are crazy studies done on certain organisms that you can cut pieces of their heart off and it'll regenerate. Um, neonatal animals, 
have this rudimentary immune system. If you cut a piece of heart off of a neonatal animal, it regenerates. If you cut a piece of a heart of an adult animal, they basically bleed out, right? And so there is this concept of what's happening. So based on that premise, I think the adaptive potential that the human gains by going through the seven day event is really this turning back the clock to a more youthful immune system that allows for all of these adaptations. The problem then is you're more prone to other things that the environment's gonna expose you to. We're assuming uh, it's gonna be a 3D answer and the rest, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. But uh, <laughs> if we look at how meta moves in, you know, <laughs> uh, with meta, I think if I heard you correctly, t the timelines to kind of publication and then timelines to potential governmental impact or those, you know, those kind of things. I think when it comes to the timelines, what we decided to do, and I like the uh, you know, foundation that, that Hamel used, we are really pouring a very, very big and strong foundation right now. Typically, you know, you, you could run with one idea. We could have taken what we found and probably slice it into three, four, five different little papers, and then you kind of put them out there and you know, have your moment, and then you, you, you fade. What we're doing right now is we want to build as big as possible on this. So this is why we are pouring this foundation. This is why we kind of con um, continue to do the same experimental designs over and over and over again at different events. So we just have the, you know, the information not only in 30 people or 60 people or 100 people, but hopefully in hundreds of people. So once you have that data set, nobody can touch you and you are so far away from everybody else that you can then build on it as high as you want. Typical example would be in the beginning, it just heard, uh, um, like I said, we were a small group, a few people started doing it, grow the, grow the group, grow the amount of uh, participants that we increase. I mean, we went from like 60 or so participants in the first year to you know over 3,000 that we have. Um, next year, we're hoping to get some data in Basel, uh, you know, Basel when, he, when George's there, where he's you know, doing a progressive in front of 10,000 people. I mean, just think about the magnitude of what we could capture. Once you have that, it's very easy to start turning on the machine and just produce the papers because then you have a set, a set of, you know, right now we grew to 30 people in the research team primarily focusing on designing the studies and collecting the studies. You know, M Michelle and Hermel are kind of holding the flag right now when it comes to data uh, interpretation and writing the papers. Michelle, hopefully one of these days, in the, hopefully in the near future, is gonna have like dozens of people working with her, you know, helping her writing paper and writing paper after paper after paper. Because once you have this big library, you can do that. So again, it depends on resources, but I wouldn't be surprised if we're gonna have something, you know, where we have like multiple paper, maybe even, you know, a dozen or so a year coming out on a regular base, hopefully in the next year or two, that we just kind of build up this group that just gonna be do, uh, able to do that. When it comes to government adaptation, I think this is something that really um, is also, you know, difficult to predict. It's, it's basically, uh, the bigger the herd, the faster the solution. Um, you know, one, one way where you've seen it, for example, um, you know, being in the medical field, interoperability of, um, different example, but interoperability of different um, um, healthcare software system was very difficult. Everybody was very protective. You can't touch my data and you can't look into something. And then COVID happened and the government said, we got to solve this and just made it mandatory for everybody to, you know, just told them from now on, you got to open to everybody that wants to talk to you kind of thing. So those kind of things could happen. There could be... Um, you know, a sense of urgency is going to make things faster. Otherwise, I think we are talking, you know, before, so if I'm a doctor and I can prescribe meditation instead of medication and uh, get reimbursed by that, uh, by an insurance company, possible. Um, you need the data that we talked about, you need randomized control trials, you need to lobby, you need all of that. It's probably, you're definitely talking in years, maybe even decades. Um, unless something happens, and we've seen it, something happens, stuff gets unpredictable. It is in the works. So um, a good opportunity to introduce a little bit more about metamorphosis. We'll have a web page soon. We're actually introducing metamorphosis that has been around for a couple of years. Dr. Joe created the company to be able to house all the data, to collect all the data from all the research, whether it's at an event or outside an event. And Michelle referenced the um, remote coherence healing, so that data is collected as well. 
part of what we're looking at doing in the course of this next year, potentially even in the next few months, is bring up a website that will allow people to see a lot of what's going on behind the scenes from an operational perspective, including the events that we plan to do research at and what those studies are. So you can begin to have some thoughts around, I want to participate in this study or that study at any particular event. It'll include opportunities for us to be able to become our own self-scientist. So whether you're in a study or under the umbrella of research, to be able to collect data on yourself and have that data so that you can then look at what your own progress is within the work. All of this is in the works right now. We'll make sure this community in particular gets information around that as soon as it's ready to be distributed. But you're getting a heads up now, a little sneak peek into what's gonna happen in the near future where you have the opportunity to be your own self-scientist and participate in the research studies that are happening at the events or outside of the events as well. The, this is something that you could start experimenting with. And this is why I think um, presenting at the events really gives you a glimpse into how our studies are designed, what kind of questions we're thinking about, and how you can start thinking about those questions for yourself as well. And there will be resources in place to, to actualize a lot of these things. A lot of the assays that we've been doing, um, there's plans in place to make various versions of those available for people to start thinking about on their own. One of the big questions we've had, and we've tried to address this, and I think some future studies are planning this, is our data collection and sample collection really starts and begins at an event. And you get lots of surveys when you leave, but again, it's tied to your self-reported aspects. We're not really collecting biological data once you leave. Some of the new systems we have that are coming into place will allow us to get and capture data once you're gone. Um, this becomes really important because then we can start tracking how long the effect is of a week-long event. We can start tracking what are other things you're doing that may be adding to that protective healing kinds of things that you're doing. And we can maybe even start predicting when you need to come to an event if you don't have a wife like mine that says three months is sort of your it, right? <laughs> Um, there'll be actual biological markers that say maybe it's time to go and re-up on this, right? And so we're, we're moving in that direction to give you as much feedback, biofeedback as we can from all of the things that we're generating data-wise. And this is one of the missions, I think, of all of the data generation that, that ultimately when we create this large database, it has to come back to the community in some way. There has to be information that you can then glean from that to get a sense of what your experience is, either at the event or at home. The other piece to add, Dr. Hemmel spoke to the paper, and yes, it helps if you've got a scientific background, but you don't need the scientific background. So I would suggest sharing the paper with anyone in any family, any friend circle, any community, where you'd like to have people give them evidence of the work that we're doing. Because even without a background, you can still glean information from that paper, and physicians in particular may find uh, the information very, very helpful. And there'll be more papers coming, right? So hopefully as that evidence builds, there'll be a stack of papers you could um, approach people with. And under proof, you'll actually down the page a little bit, you'll have access to uh, the presentation that was done in Vienna that introduced the paper, and it's about 24-minute video that talks about the key points of the paper, four in particular, and then a link to the paper itself that you can go in further. So the IRB um, that Toby is the PI of has the ability to, to get access to your medical records. We've not engaged in that arm yet, because um, again, like you need an army of physicians that could do that. Um, as AI and other systems progress, we may not have to do that, right? You can basically go in and do smart language processing to just pull out information. Um, there are a couple of our faculty that are doing that, and I think we need to have a conversation with them to get access, right? And then you can start building, like you said, their past story, their current story, and where they're headed in the future, and I think that's gonna be very important to do. The other piece to add, and I referenced it previously, Inner Health Coalition, the physicians that are there, one of Dr. Joe's objectives is to be able to have those physicians involved in case studies. So the information that comes in through the stories of transformation, we've completely revised the story of transformation process for gathering that information in the front end. There's a QR code available. If you use that QR code and upload information about your particular situation, including any medical records that you give us the ability to look at, then between research and InterHealth Coalition, we'll find the right avenue to be able to start exploring that. 
So that can even be the beginning of that process is available today. No, so that's a good question. Um, so we've started thinking about this. There are groups on campus that do mindfulness-based programs, and we're trying to get access to blood from them to do the same things we're doing with the Joe data set. Um, there's a breathing study that I'm involved in on campus, and so it'll be looking at medical students that go through breath work to see what happens with that. A large element of what you do here at these events is breathing, right? And so what, what is that impact? Um, there's a yoga center on campus as well, so we think that we'll have access to those populations and, and sample sets from that. Um, so we are starting to think about how to build other practices to see what the differences and similarities are between what happens here versus there, and then really define what, what's truly happening in this space. Because there, like Michelle said and alluded to, like, it is a happy stress state that's happening, which is not what most meditative practices do. They put you in a happy, relaxed state, and the effects are different. Um, we think that this happy stress state really leads to more chronic changes than the happy, relaxed state, and these kinds of data would allow us to sort all that out. I haven't thought about that yet. Um, that doesn't mean we can't do it. Um, and I think those are more global intentionality kinds of things, right? And I think the start of this was what we did this week. Um, this walk for the world, I think, is the way to do this. If you're gonna make a, a, a mega change that impacts the whole planet, that's the level of involvement and engagement you're gonna need. Time is probably 50, 60, right? And I think that's when you're gonna see that effect. And I think there's some preliminary data from your, remote, your healing studies with the cells that shows that there is definitely an impact of intention on cellular physiology. The, there's been a lot of discussion with groups that are doing similar things, right? There's a, a study ongoing at, at Baylor and other places where they see similar effects, but it's a single energy healer that puts their hands around cancer. And the cool experiments they do is they actually implant tumors and they can show tumors are shrinking as well. And so it's this crazy amazing effect but that paper will probably, and ours, will probably sit in a very crappy journal because there is no mechanistic information there, right? We don't know how the information goes from here to here, and that's where it's a science paper versus a this journal does not exist.com paper, right? <laughs> um, and, and I think that's the limitation is, that, is we don't have the tools to go from here to here but we know that here to here is creating an effect. Um, so the next evolution of where the research team is headed, and, and again, I guess I believe in synchronicities. Um, a good friend of mine uh, is Egyptian, and he interestingly got a PhD in Japan, defended his thesis in Japanese, and so this tells you the way his mind works and his adaptability to learn language and and his PhD was in physics, right, which is not an easy subject to get a PhD in. Um, he was at UCSD for a number of years. We worked on a lot of projects together, looking at free radical generation and different systems, and he had all these physical ways of looking at this. Um, some of the techniques that he developed in the lab are how we've been looking at how water changes in the meditative system as well. And so he'd gone back to Egypt um, during the sort of the, the movements to, you know, democratize and stuff, and there was a huge science movement. He was visiting San Diego a few weeks ago, and we had dinner, and we hadn't talked in years, and we started talking about what we do, and, and he was sort of astonished, and he said, I think I could build a thing that could measure all that stuff that's going on in that room. I'm like, cool. So we're, this is the next level. We need to start engaging with people that think way outside of our box, right? I'm a biologist. I don't think about the physical aspect of things. Um, to solve some of these issues that we have lingering around. And so that's where we're headed with, with developing new devices and things as well. We can do kind of observational studies. We can just say, you know, we've heard this or seen this, but if you want to go more into the mechanistic aspects, you have to have a way of measuring it. And for a lot of the things that we're interested in, there's simply no tools right now to measure that. You know, the whole energy transfer, the whole, you know, medium, how, how that actually functions. Even if we have glimpses of ideas and kind of idea, you know, experimental design ideas, there's, there's no such thing as in 
you know, make make your Taurus field visible. How cool would that be? You know, have a little device, push the button, and can see the field. I mean, then we can study. But we need somebody to come up with that. You know, we don't have that yet. But to the initial question about meditation's effects on non-human, uh, or you know, the, the environment, things like that. If you, if you, we, you know, if you st take it away from meditations, we know, for example, that playing music affects the way the plants grow. So th there is something, or you know, words attached to, uh, to to water changes the you know structure of water. Those kind of things. So again, you can observe. It's difficult to uh, pe put a mechanism behind it, and you're always going to be uh, facing. Rightfully so, I think, you know, criticism or, you know, what if you haven't really proved anything unless you really can design the studies that you need to prove it. And the reason why we don't do that right now is we simply don't have the tools. That's where I think the flip videos come in. I've had lots of people come up um, to us saying that it's amazing to have this record of someone's evolution, right? And and. They're, they actually go back and watch their old videos and they can't recognize who they were from who they are now. Um, having these large video libraries that have the language, the facial features, and the, the sound, I think is gonna get at some of these questions. Um, we, have, we have been thinking about um, a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists are, are in this work and, and we've talked about developing a, a survey instrument to look at personality. I think personality, one of the things that Joe talks about is you're a new person at the end of the week. We haven't really quantified that, right? I mean, we've seen it in sort of anecdotal expression kinds of things. People say crazy things to me, like I look younger and um, less round, which is great. Um, <laughs> I don't see it, but that's fine. Um, but there is no quantifiable way of looking at this stuff, and this is where we need to head. And I think these flip videos, and Jeff's here from um, Oklahoma, who's really in the language processing aspect. And his background is looking at how educational systems show transformation in, in individuals as they go through that system. And applying those kinds of algorithms to what happens in these rooms are going to give us lots of information about ways to track change and transformation. Um, I, it's sort of scary to look at the database because there's so many videos. Um, if, if people participate, like just the global study, there's probably about a thousand people that recorded videos and each of them recorded seven or so videos over that time. So it's 7,000 videos that we're looking at in that database of information of evolution, right? And so it's a lot of information that's going to move into quantifying that aspect. One thing that we observed in studies where we did uh, the EEG while patients were, uh, were participants, sorry, I'm always going to patients, but participants, <laughs> while they were meditating, you know, um, there was kind of like an empiric observation um, that certain words seem to really trigger certain responses in the EEG. And that's also something that I've, you know, heard um, participants say that, you know, oh, I can't wait for him to say whatever that word is. Once that word is out, that just sucks me right in. And I think the power of words is really um, something that would be interesting to yeah. dissect further. Um, you know, I personally, I, f I, f I forgot which book it was, but I read the, um, you know, one thing that really changed the way that I, I changed the word and it really had a big impact on me was this, um, I think I read it or somebody told me, uh, stop saying or thinking, I don't have time for that and say, I don't, don't take time for that. It just, mind-blowing how that changed, how I approach uh, things. And you're a lot more honest, you know, having to tell somebody, sorry, I, didn't, I just didn't, time to do, I didn't take time to do that for you, makes you think different ab ab about it, and you're more honest to yourself. So th there's a, cl uh, you know, a clear value in being very precise in words and really thinking about them, or kind of what, what their impact is for, for the individual. You have to study a lot of people, you have to collect a lot of data, but that's precisely the power of what we're doing here. You know, th there might be subtle, subtle signals, big signals. You know, this is kind of, you know, talking about the power to see, uh, show something in a study. If, if it's black and white, you don't really have to sample a lot to say this, you know, to see a difference. The differences are subtle. You have to look at a lot of people. And then even, you know, th uh, to the level where, where, uh, where we are at right now is that, if the data sets are so large, you may not even pick it up. A human may not even pick changes up. This is where AI and you know deep learning comes into play. We can create that. This is kind of you know back to the p uh, point when I said earlier we're pouring this foundation. This is precisely what we're doing. We want to have such a rich data set. 
that we can answer questions like that in the future, hopefully, uh, you know, with meaningful out outcomes. It's a good opportunity for us to say, thank you for your patience. <laughs> because as much as we're talking about and as fast as we'd like to move, it takes time. And we're, we have increased the size of the team. We have increased our resources. We certainly can always use more. But thank you for the patience in allowing us to be able to do this right, to be able to speak to it accurately, because it's very, very important. And as you know, as a community and Dr. Joe himself, we're not going to say half of what the truth is. We're going to find the truth that we can give at any given time and be able to speak to it that way. So thank you. The researchers don't necessarily know what you guys do or don't know, so I just want to build a model just for a second of what they just talked about, that when we're in a meditation and there's music playing, we know the exact time that the music started, we know exactly what Dr. Said, Dr. Joe said, when he said it, it's synchronized with time code and everything we know to the second with the HRVs that everybody's wearing, the... Um, the Garmin watches, that, that's the HRV, their EEG measurements, and then they go back to their room and they're still wearing those devices for this dream study, and then they get on their flip phone and they record that, we know exactly what time they recorded it, and then when they said the word, whatever, it's ineffable, and you see what happens to their heart and their brain, all of that gets coordinated and organized, so that's how they're able to zoom in and see such incredible detail and, and make those connections and see what's going on. And someone, a, a participant said to me last night, oh my God, Jeff is gonna have to sit and watch all those videos I did. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> that does, he's gonna know so much about me, he's gonna think I'm crazy. This is what she said to me last night. I said, I said no, we get it transcribed. Correct me if I'm wrong, it gets transcribed. It gets fed into a computer. It's looking for words. It, it's the word usage, how often it's used, and then he can also compare that to the moment it was used and what's going on with the other data that was collected. So no one's having to sit there and watch it, but it, you can see that it's billions of data points just from an individual from a week long, and then we've got all the individuals and all the different data sets. So there's a lot going on. And the other thing you guys talk about are, are the IRBs, and I, does everybody know what an IRB is? No, a lot of head nods. It's, it's um, the institutional uh, research board that kind of guides what can and can't happen and what's okay to do to humans or animals or things like that. And so, so there, there's a lot that we're asking for from the participants, but it's within the guidelines of acceptability. We're not saying, oh, we're gonna take your left arm and, and analyze it, although I'm sure Toby would love that, but <laughs> he'll take as much as he can get, but they're the ones that are gonna say, hey, this is how far you can go or not go. This is my layman's explanation, so please, if you have more to add to that. Okay. Um. I, I think I'm excited about all of the potential we see, right? There's so much data we have sitting around in our freezers. And we just, we have, I mean, the presentation we had yesterday was, was what are the sample sets that exist and what are the questions we can ask? And they're infinite. There's so many possibilities that exist. And the databases that we're building are going to be insane, right? And eventually, the community will have access to this. We're building a back end where it'll be essentially like a Google platform. You go into this database, you ask it a question, right? Is there a link between meditation and heart disease? It'll go into the data set, pull out all of the information and make it present for you. That excites me that the community can then engage in a system that gives them evidence for what they're questioning and what they're experiencing. I'm really excited about sharing all of what we have with, you know, the scientific community and the world. Um, we are doing so much, and while there's lots of meditation studies out there, there are none that are as comprehensive and big as what we're doing. So I think it's going to have a major impact on the field. You know, what, what my dream really is, is uh, the, the opportunity to build a you know, the Meditation Research Institute that is going to be recognized as kind of the gold standard. And I'm not saying that because, you know, any one of us wants to become famous or those kind of things, but um, it's, it's amazing, you know, 
you notice when when Hamel said that UCSD announced that there's going to be funding coming to to him for, to do meditation research. All of a the sudden, there's people coming wanting to uh, collaborate because I think you know it, 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 those kind of questions are really interesting to pretty much anybody who's doing research. And it's very difficult. Most people you can't communicate with. You know, it's kind of like one of these ha 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 ideas, and it's kind of like something you talk talk about. You know, over a cocktail at dinner. It's not what you talk about in a in a in a you know journal club or those kind of things necessarily. And second, even if you have, if you have an idea and you want to do it, there's really no go to place. There's no kind of you know expert or or, or foundational um, 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 resource right now that is where you would go to if you want to do meditation research. And I really believe that Dr. Joe has the ability to create that. And there's many things that have to come together. Uh, you know, the, the finances, you know, you, 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 you have to be endorsed, you have to have some kind of a donor that can, can start something beautiful like this. And we are well on the way to do that. You need an institution that supports that. We have that uh, at UCSD is really amazing. We met with the, you know, the chairman of the anesthesia department. It's not, e it's not only allowing this to happen, she's excited for this to happen. She wants us to study patients, providers, and, uh, and participants in, in, in research. So there's a lot of things that come together. Then you have somebody like Dr. Joe who really wants research. You know, we had this conversation yesterday at dinner. One thing that I think we don't really point out, um, but I'm gonna do it at this point, um, when when we talk to Joe about you know bringing a, a a different level of of scientific rigor to what he's doing, just put yourself in his shoes. And I'm going to be you know of course this is not him talking, that's me talking. If you came up with a formula or a thing that makes sense, you see people change, you make good money with it, you have people that buy the idea, you have a few books out out based you know that kind of build your your study. The last thing you do is somebody messing with your story. I mean, think about it. This is his livelihood. This is what he built in his, this is his, his, his reputation, career, everything. And, you know, somebody coming alongside, you, get, you know, I would like to look under your hood. Most people would say, you know what, I'm good. The car's driving nice. You know, I, I like it. I don't need anything. You don't have to check my engines. All good, you know. I let you know. That's not what he said. He literally said, you know what, if the data shows something different, I will change my story. I'm just, we're all learning. I can, I want to teach to the, to the best ability of my knowledge. And if my knowledge expands, my story will adapt. It's just the way it is. I was, this is the moment where I said, I'm going to work with that guy. Because that is a scientist talking. That is not a businessman talking. This is not a guy, don't touch my reputation talking. That's somebody who wants, who's seeking the truth. And that has to come to that too. So we have all of that coming together. We have the resources coming, we have an established Ivy League institution wants to support that, and we have somebody who's leading the research, uh, Dr. Joe, who's really interested in, in, in finding stuff out. And I think if you combine that, we can create this gold standard for meditation research that people will globally go to, and it's the snowball effect. All you need is you know a little bit of snow in a long hill. If we just start doing that, once you've established it, more people come, and then the more people come, the more other people know about it. And at one point, everybody wants to be you know, playing with the cool kids. It's kind of like if everybody is going to UCSD to the whatever, Dr. Jewelry Meditation Research Center, you want to be part of that too. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then you just, you know, you, you're this magnet that creates all of the, of the interested people that, that, that are excited about it to come together. And then, you know, with all of these collaborations, I mean, if, if my, you know, things that we, they want to study, if we had to do a search and try to find people convinced to come on board and then find the resources to pay for them, it would be, a, it would be meta, <laughs> meta trying to move meta. You know, it's a lot of time, a lot of resources that they have to move. Right now, literally things are coming to us. And I think if we just focus on building that as a bigger magnet, it's gonna be a way how we can change the world. The piece that I'm most excited about is you, to be very honest with you, because you've asked for things that we've been able to bring you, including the become your own self-scientist, more access to the data, more ability to see the evidence, the loudest voice. 
And as we continue to listen to you and as we continue to be able to build the pieces, the mechanisms to provide you the information that you're asking for, to Toby's point, this will continue to move forward. This will continue to change the world. And so that piece is what I'm probably most grateful for as well. What I'm most looking forward to is looking back on all of this, looking back on what we did and that we did it and we changed the world because this is what's going to happen. We're going to change the world with health care and make it true health care. It's been sick care for too long. So I love you guys so much and I appreciate you and you know, you're just making so much magic happen and it's, it's so nice to see. Thank you. I am so motivated to do what I do because of you guys. And uh, witnessing transformation in myself and others is incredible. And the only thing I'd add to Toby's, I, I was like, yeah, the first thing I thought of was Inner Science Research Institute. And we'll add Dr. Joe's name on that too, but w why not? Like we, the, the $10 million um, contribution donation to UC San Diego um, felt really big last year. and. Like, oh, wow, that's a big goal. We've got a long ways to go. And now it doesn't feel so far away. Like, now it's like, okay, what's our dream? Where do we want to go next? So I, I really think it's, it's much bigger than that because we are doing that. And we did just approve another $800,000 um, for the global study. Just got approved yesterday. The global study is now moving forward, uh, hopefully at a more rapid pace, because um, Dr. Hemmel is able to outsource some of that analysis and get it done faster so that Michelle and the team can write the papers and deliver it to you guys and just have more information to prove the transformation. Thank you all. Thanks so much. <laughs>